Welcome to another uh, McDonald Hopkins Energy Forum. I think this is our 13th such forum, and I believe it's our fourth shale review, uh, which has always been one of the most popular forums, and this is the first time that we've been down in Columbus, and we're really happy about uh, being down in Columbus, being at the state capitol, and having a state senator be on our panel. So. Um, before we get started, just three quick introductions. Uh, if you want to know anything about McDonald Hopkins, we have the president of the firm here today, uh, Sean Riley, and we've also got the co-chair of uh, the energy practice. Uh, I'm a co-chair as well, but Matt Reckner just recently moved into the co-chair position, and he's here. And then I don't know whether Pete Willeen's here or not, but he runs, there he is, he runs our Columbus office. So. Anything you want to know about McDonald Hopkins, we've got three leaders here and you can uh, see them. Uh, before we get to the panel though, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we've got a special guest. Uh, we weren't sure that she could make it or not, but the Lieutenant Governor is here today, uh, Mary Taylor. And she's been a great friend of the industry here in Ohio, the oil and gas industry. Uh, she started as a state rep, she became um, state auditor and then um, Lieutenant Governor, State Auditor, right? Yes. And uh, yes, and as, as Lieutenant Governor, the thing that I uh, really appreciate about Mary is a brand new initiative was started uh, under her leadership, which was the Common Sense Initiative. And I'm just amazed that every state doesn't have it, but it's a review of every regulation that gets proposed to make sure that it's not duplicative and that it's not overly burdensome on business. And it's just been a wonderful program that's really helped uh, balance all the competing interests that we have in the state of Ohio. And under Mary's leadership, I'm sure it's something that will be continued and probably expand to other states as well. But uh, here to give just a few remarks before we start the program is Mary Taylor. I think it's still good morning. It's like right at the cusp. Good morning or good afternoon, whatever your watch says. Um, well, it's great to, to be with all of you, and I wish I could stay long enough to hear the panel. I'm sure they're going to have some great insight that maybe somebody can send me a text. Troy, send me a text. Tell me what we're going to be talking <laughs> about so I know, what to, I know what to look forward to. Um, I love this quote. Wilbur Wright once said, if giving a young man advice about how he might succeed in life I'll say a young woman and how she might succeed in life. Uh, I would say to her, pick out a good father and a mother, which we all know we have no control over, and begin life in Ohio. And, and that's absolutely true, right? Begin life in Ohio. Uh, Ohio is where I was born and, and where I have lived my entire life. And I think that statement, that quote, truly represents all of the opportunity that we have here in Ohio to recognize our own American dream. Uh, there's no doubt that we have faced some challenges along the way. Um, we certainly had a significant challenge coming into office in 2011, but I can tell you from my perspective what I've tried to do the last 15 years, uh, first as a state representative and then as your auditor and today as your lieutenant governor, um, my responsibility is to work to remake Ohio a great place for all of us to experience our own opportunity. Uh, Mike mentioned CSI. It is, uh, not, it is unique. It is not only first in the country, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it is the only uh, regulatory reform initiative like it in the country. Um, we've had some interest from some other states call us and ask us what it's all about, um, and we hope that and would encourage them to look at how they can do regulatory reform in their state. Uh, very simply, what we do is we get stakeholders at the table to participate in the regulatory making process. Uh, I had a great conversation with Mike before we walked in today, and um, what I'd like to say is, our process and then the ultimate outcome of the regulation is only as good as those involved in the process. And so I really, really encourage industry to be a part of the rulemaking process so that we are confident we had a great process, but the best outcome we could potentially get. Uh, we won't always 
promise that we're all going to agree at the end of the day that everything um, is exactly what everybody wanted, um, but we will agree, and what I will commit to you through my involvement at CSI is you will have a seat at the table, and you will get to participate in the, pro the process. I, I think in a crowd like this, certainly um, I don't have to tell you how important the shale industry is to the state of Ohio. I have been actively involved um, from the beginning, um, first from a regulatory perspective, um, but also I signed the tri-state agreement with West Virginia and Pennsylvania uh, that I think recognizes that this industry is not just a state industry and our challenges are not just state challenges, um, but it's an opportunity for our entire region. It's an opportunity, but we also recognize that some of the challenges that we face are regional challenges as well. My goal, of course, in this tri-state region is that not only does the, um, the oil and the gas and the shale not recognize state boundaries, it would sure be nice if we could have some cooperation with our neighbors to be able to say that we recognize in the, the, the way that we do business um, should not recognize those state boundaries. I, there certainly are some challenges around that, um, but we have a great opportunity, not just in the state of Ohio, but in this entire region and to the extent that we can cooperate and work together, I think it's going to be better, not only for Ohio as a state, for our citizens, but I'd hope and like to think that it's also going to be better for the industry as well. Um, you know as, as well as I do, the eastern part of our state, some of the counties that have faced the most significant challenges in the last 20 or 30 years have reaped the most benefits um, from this industry because that's where the shale play is. Um, and so it's great for Appalachia, it's great for southeastern Ohio, it's great for the families who live there to experience this opportunity. And I think from a state perspective, our responsibility is to make sure that we aren't the roadblock um, to those opportunities, but yet we are, are a partner with you in achieving the success that we know can come um, from this particular industry. When you look at PTT Chemical, PPT, PTT Chemical is a name familiar to all of you and um, what they're looking at putting their cracker plant in Southeast Ohio and Belmont County. That certainly is a game changer um, from a lot of different perspectives for Southeast Ohio, for the entire state, and in fact for our march or our goal towards energy independence. We had a great conversation. Mike asked me the question about the energy conference that we held several years ago and really what my perspective was as we move forward. And I think that that energy conference was a good place to start in the conversation that took place. Um, this industry has evolved in a pretty significant way since 2011, and I think that we now recognize our, our future opportunities uh, in a different way than we knew even then. And so what I hope my goal is and what I hope our goal is that as we move forward, we, we look for all of the opportunities to take advantage of the great natural resource that is there. Um, Ohio has always been a great manufacturing state. One of our advantages has been low energy prices. Of course, we're centrally located and we have fresh water. But as I think about what our future opportunity is with the shale play, um, to continue to take advantage of and grow that manufacturing base because of low cost energy. And I'd like to think about how we move forward and be able to attract that more manufacturing and, in, and industry closer to the, app, it, to the Appalachian where we know this resource is so rich. I don't want to under, understate how important this interest, industry has been to Ohio for the last five years. Um, and I certainly don't want to underestimate or understate how important this industry is to the future economic prosperity of the state of Ohio. And I'm optimistic that um, in my conversations today with Mike and others, um, my participation in the Tri-State um, Shale Conference of, of just a few weeks ago and having conversations with industry there, um, we have a great resource in our state in Ohio, we have a great opportunity, and I can commit to you that I want to be able to take advantage of this for all of Ohio's citizens. 
One of the things that we announced um, when I was in uh, Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh at the Tri-State Shale Conference was a report that was released um, while we were there by the U.S. Chamber that highlighted the positive impact of your industry um, and how it boosts our economy here in Ohio. Uh, and what they did is they kind of looked at it from a neg the, in the negative form is what, what would the economy look like or what would the economic impact be if your industry didn't exist. And we, of course, specifically what we were interested in what Ohio would look like. And I think that what the report showed was what we already knew, but it was actually nice to see it um, put it on a piece of paper in numbers. And so what they concluded is without the presence of the economic shot of adrenaline and lower residential and industrial energy prices, the report estimates that $9.9 .9 billion in Ohio GDP would not have been generated. That's Ohio alone. $5.8 billion in labor income would have been lost and 114,500 jobs would not have been created. So I think those numbers speak for themselves. You are significant, you are important, and you are a great economic, future economic opportunity uh, for the state of Ohio. So I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you this morning and to just recommit to you um, that we will, we can and we will take advantage of this economic opportunity in the, in the way that it benefits all of Ohio's citizens. And part of that, obviously, is your industry success as well. So thank you for the invitation to join you. I always uh, look forward to seeing many of you who I've known for some time and, of course, always look forward to, to making new friends. I wish I could stay for the panel. I'm sure you're going to say very important things that I need to hear. Um, but I'm going to finish my lunch and then I need to get out of here. I'm headed to Dayton. But Mike, thank you for hosting this. And obviously the work that you guys are doing is certainly very important to the state of Ohio. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, this, this forum is uh, a collaboration between the Ohio Chamber and McDonnell Hopkins. And I did ask... Uh, uh, Zach Freimeyer to come up uh, just for a couple minutes and he's the uh, director of energy policy for the chamber is very involved in the legislative effort and he's just going to give us a two or three minute update on it. He's doing a good job too place. Andy. So Zach. He's doing a good job. Uh, first off, I appreciate the opportunity to give a legislative update um, on some issues that are very important to ensuring that this industry continues to grow and contributes to the state of Ohio. Um, I'll try to be brief so we can move into the panel that I know folks are, are here to, to listen and learn from. Um, just a couple issues that the Chamber has been working on in close conjunction with industry um, that we expect to continue as we look towards the next legislative session. One in particular, uh, unitization reform. Um, I'm sure most folks in the room are familiar with the efforts to get a streamlined process uh, from the regulatory agencies in the state um, to ensure that businesses are moving at appropriate speed and continuing to develop our shale, gas, and oil resources. The Chamber has been supportive of that effort um, in the past, and we continue to see that conversation move forward um, in the future, in particular during next year's budget cycle. Um, I'm sure folks understand that we've run into some issues where unitization has been um, kind of tied up with, with outstanding other issues in the industry. Um, but from the Chamber's perspective and, and working closely with industry, we definitely expect to continue to push to see some reform in that area. Um, another issue that the Chamber works closely on is the critical energy infrastructure that's essential to continuing to develop the shale, oil, and gas play. In particular, two, two pipelines that we've made a big push to support um, and, and make federal regulators, uh, the broader community and, and citizens aware of um, Nexus in particular and, and Rover. Um, both are hopefully close to approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, we've been active out there highlighting the economic benefits, um, not only directly in the communities where this oil and gas activity is occurring, but also the broader economic um, benefits to the entire state and region, quite frankly. Um, but definitely, we look forward to committing to ensuring that Ohio is, is open for business and is a great place for this industry to continue to grow.
Okay, so we'll get into the panel. Uh, Andy Durrell is going to chair the panel, so we've got uh, somebody with a lot of experience in running these things. And uh, Andy's been, um, you know, we're fortunate the Ohio Chamber's arguably the best trade group in the state of Ohio for supporting business, and they have arguably the best CEO of all the trade groups uh, leading them. <laughs> Uh, and we have him here running our panel. Uh, Andy's got a, a long list of questions and he can keep this panel busy for the whole afternoon, but we do take questions at our forum. So there's cards at your table and if you wanna fill out a card somebody and raise your hand, somebody will come around and uh, grab your card and give it to me and we'll supplement Andy's questions with your questions. Um, on the panel, uh, again, it's just a fantastic panel. First of all, uh, Mike Moore on the far left, the CEO of Gulfport Energy. Uh, Gulfport is the most active driller now in the Utica, and I think this is Mike's third time uh, leading the way on this end of the year review of shale, so we're really happy to welcome him back. And then Senator Troy Balderson. Uh, Troy is uh, smack dab in the middle of the shale play, the Utica play, his district. And he's also chair of the Senate Energy Committee. So he's just been an absolutely key person in the General Assembly as far as the industry. Uh, Rick Simmers, who runs the oil and gas division for ODNR. Uh, Ohio's been very fortunate to have somebody with uh, the knowledge and the longevity of Rick. And he's seen and overseen the transformation of the oil and gas industry in the state of Ohio from a bunch of vertical wells to these very sophisticated multi-million dollar horizontal wells. So we've been very fortunate to have Rick in the position that he holds with the state of Ohio. And then finally, Don Templin, who's an executive with Marathon Petroleum and is actually president of their midstream group. Uh, Marathon is a key player, uh, not just here in Ohio, but across the whole world. Uh, they're one of the largest organizations, corporations in the United States. Uh, it's great having Don here as well. Um, we realized uh, a few months ago when we were putting together this panel that we both graduated the same year from Grove City College. So it's great to have another Grover here on the <coughs> panel. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop with the introductions and uh, turn it over to you, Andy, to start the panel. Great. First thing we have to clear up is this arguably the best. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how that could be an argument, but uh, moving from there, we'll move on. Um, I want to just give a little bit of context before we start asking some questions of the panel. And again, as I understand it, uh, Mike has been very clear. We really want to try and answer what you want to know. Uh, instead of us kind of preaching at you, this long list of questions that I have in front of me. So please feel free to put a question together. Mike will take a look at them and make sure I can read them with my glasses on and everything, and uh, we'll try and get everything answered. So I just wanted to give a quick little context for the whole discussion today, uh, because I think everybody says, oh yeah, this is a big deal, but how'd we get here? Where'd we come from? Maybe a little known fact, because I didn't know it until my staff had put it together, but Ohio was at one point in our history the leading producer of oil in the world. Yes, in the world. It goes back to the late 1800s. John D. Rockefeller uh, put together Standard Oil. It was based out of Cleveland. Uh, and the oil finds here in Ohio helped propel our industrial revolution uh, and us becoming a heavy industry state because you had access to what at the time was an inexpensive uh, resource that powered industry. And so this region, when you think about Michigan and Indiana being manufacturing type states as well, that's where we came from. Uh, and what was interesting, obviously what happened over time was the rest of the world started uh, drilling and coming up with all sorts of different oil finds that were cheaper to extract and more plentiful. Uh, and so Ohio kind of fell by the wayside. But now we're back and we're back uh, in a very major type of way. 
uh, with hydraulic fracturing and with what we're doing in Marcellus uh, in Utica, obviously. Uh, and when this whole thing kind of started, and of course Ohio wasn't the first state to do it, uh, the chamber early on said, you know, we need to kind of look at this industry as it started to uh, get put together. And so there is an early on shale coalition, and back in late uh, 2010 and into 2011, we actually did a study about what the impact of shale could mean in the state of Ohio. And I think it's always interesting to look back a little bit because we had a major findings, great research. In fact, I think a couple of the researchers that actually worked on this are part uh, of our audience today, uh, so welcome back. Uh, and they took a look and said, what could this mean for Ohio as we looked out from 2011, looking out through 2014? And what they projected was that we'd create 65,000 uh, new jobs by 2014, uh, and $9.6 billion would be invested in the state of Ohio. Well, now we fast forward to 2017, uh, and we certainly have surpassed those numbers in a very, very big way. Uh, you heard the Lieutenant Governor mention the U.S. Chamber study. She, of course, took away my thunder once again because that was part of my presentation. <laughs> they mentioned the U.S. Chamber study. Thank you, Mary. Um, but it's pretty interesting, and as she mentioned, it's kind of a negative report in the context of, you know, what would happen if you banned fracking tomorrow? And as we know, there are a lot of efforts out there to prohibit fracking. Uh, you see it at a local level, statewide levels, even on the national level. Uh, and a very insightful study to say, well, here's what would happen. And what's interesting is if that happened, Ohio is one of four states that would be impacted the most. The other ones are Texas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. So we're one of the four states that would take the biggest hits. Uh, and those hits would be comprised of, uh, in the next five years, almost 400,000 lost jobs. Uh, that's sobering numbers when you think about uh, the impact. So, we know it's important. We kind of thought it was important. The studies have shown it's important. Uh, and so, we want to make sure we understand what's going on today and what might be going on uh, in the near future in this whole field. So thank all the panelists again for being here. I will repeat one more time, unless you want to hear me continue to ask questions, which is never really pretty. Uh, you should go ahead and write some questions down uh, and make sure you get the answers you want to hear. But to get started, we're going to turn to the private sector, my most favorite part of any presentation, the private sector, and ask Mike Moore uh, to please comment on the following. Over the past several months, we have seen a number of both corporate and leasehold transactions occurring in the oil and gas sector, including many here in Appalachia. What are your current thoughts on additional merger and acquisitions slash consolidations, uh, especially here in Ohio? Okay, uh, first of all, let me say it's, um, it feels interesting being called the private sector as a public company, but I understand where we've got public government up here. So, um, and, and to further clarify your comments and, and Mary's comments, you talked about job creation, um, you know, 65 to 114,000 jobs. Um, and you talked about 9.6 billion of, of money spent. Um, my estimates are that inception to date, there's actually been 40 to 45 billion spent in the state of Ohio. Um, from our industry, and that's just the upstream space. It doesn't speak to, to Don's uh, midstream space, which is another significant amount as well. So, quite a bit of money. Um, but to answer your question <laughs> that Thanks. you asked, <laughs> um, you know, there has been a lot of activity recently, and I think that speaks to the quality of the resource here and uh, that you have here in Appalachia. 
Um, I think what for us, for, for Gulfport, um, I think organic leasing opportunity is probably um, our best opportunity. Uh, the leases, I, I'm not sure if the room is aware, but generally the leases we were able to negotiate with the landowners when we uh, started this play uh, back in 2010 uh, were five, five year initial terms with five year kickers. And so we're, we're about, you know, in a lot of cases, we're about at the end or will be in the next few years at the end of the initial five year term. So there's going to be a lot of acreage expiring and I think opportunities for Goldport to grow uh, their pos position organically um, just from those leasing opportunities. So I, I think for us, um, it's more likely that you see us do organic leasing opportunity versus a corporate um, uh, merger or consolidation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to Don now, right here in the script, so you're ready. I'm, I am now ready. Okay. There are many infrastructure projects across the United States that receive a lot of headline news, uh, but how should we think about the pipelines most directly mm -hmm. critical to Appalachia's uh, future growth? For instance, are these projects economical at today's prices, uh, and will they prevail through the FERC process to begin construction? Uh, well, maybe let me give a sort of a, a kind of a higher level perspective, Andy, and then I'll, I'll come to a couple of those maybe specific points. But when I think about infrastructure, you know, Mike and Gulfport and companies like that have done a fantastic job of developing the resource. And in fact, one of the things that's happened when they've developed that resource is they've actually outpaced the infrastructure ability to take that resource and move it to global markets or markets where it's not constrained here just in the basin. And so one of the things that you know, we are doing at MPLX, which is a subsidiary of Marathon, and then Mark West, which is a subsidiary of MPLX, is working really hard at developing infrastructure projects that allow for the takeaway capacity so that the producers or our customers can realize a higher net back. And, and why is that important? If we think about prices, they've been depressed. Commodity prices have been very depressed over the last couple of years, particularly. And so we've seen some improvement in, and some maybe some optimism in, in some of those prices, both gas and natural gas liquid prices. But I think what people fail to recognize, particularly as it relates to Utica and Marcellus, is how steep a discount the gas and natural gas liquids that are produced here trade compared to the world prices. So let me give you a good example. Uh, last summer, or the summer of 15, propane was trading, I want to say, in the mid-30 cent range per gallon, and, and Mount Bellevue in the Gulf Coast would be sort of the marker for propane. The propane in the Utica Marcellus was trading at a 30 cent discount to Mount Bellevue. So producer customers were getting five cents a gallon for their propane they can't even cover their, their costs at five cents a gallon. So infrastructure, you need infrastructure to be able to support the producers, the, the resources there. We have some fantastic producers in, in the region. They know how to do what they do in a super efficient manner. But what they need help on is we can't help with, I'll call it the world prices, but we can help greatly eliminate or reduce that differential to those market or world prices. Natural gas is another good example. This, this couple months ago was probably trading at $1.50 maybe, $1.75 discount to you know, a, 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 normal, a normal index. And so you know, we're all about trying to address infrastructure. So now you go to the pipelines that you're talking about. Those pipelines, Rover and Nexus and a whole bunch of other pipelines are all focused at taking the resource that's plentiful in this market, in this basin, and taking it to a world market to entice our producers to continue to do what they do super well. Very good. I'm going to make sure that all the panel gets a chance to at least uh, espouse a little bit here. So we're going to turn to the public sector uh, and ask Rick if he would comment on Ohio's oil and gas conservation laws are widely considered to be some of the best in the nation. However, they are largely designed for conventional vertical development. 
Can you describe how ODNR has been able to work within the existing regulatory framework and propose necessary rule changes to fit the context of horizontal shale development? Um, in late 2011, the Department of Natural Resources, which is the primary regulatory agency for oil and gas, took a look at all the statutes that were currently on the books at that time. Um, we did what we called a gap analysis. We took uh, our regulations as they addressed a permit application as it would come in, the permitting process, drilling, production, and then ultimately plugging of a well, and everything that occurs in between. And everything that occurs in between can encompass quite a few years, decades, or many decades in some cases for the life of a well. So we evaluated if our statutes uh, had any gaps, any flaws in their enforcement through the entire life of a well. Through several bills, we updated the statutory authority in the state. What we've been focused on more recently is updating the rules. Ohio statute was um, first authorized in 1965, so it's a little over 50 years old now. <laughs> Some of those statutes hadn't been changed. There were gaps in it where we needed to create new statutes. But many of the rules were developed at that time as well. So we had real gaps where at, at the time when it was created, the statutes and rules effectively regulated the conventional industry. But as the shale industry came in, um, there were clearly gaps. Examples of that include well pads. Well pads for conventional wells are typically about a quarter acre, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, for shale wells, they can easily be five acres or more. Um, companies came into Ohio from out of state. They weren't familiar with our topography and the development in the area. At the time we began to promulgate a rule for pad construction, there were about 600 pads that were already constructed. Of those 600 pads, over 300 of them had some form of a catastrophic engineering failure. Um, we worked with the industry. We held many, many meetings with the industry. The lieutenant governor mentioned the CSI process. It's the Common Sense Initiative, which her office initiated. Any agency that's hoping to promulgate a rule has to draft the rule. And then we go to uh, the affected party. In this case, it's the oil and gas industry. So we go to the affected party and we work through our draft of a rule, and we take their comments and considerations uh, very seriously. And we may modify quite a bit of language in the draft rule. We then open up conversation with interested parties. These might be environmental groups or others that have an interest in the rule and its impact. We have to go to the CSI office then and propose the rule, and then we go through a cost analysis for that. What's gonna be the impact on the regulatory agency, the regulated industry, and others if there is a cost. So you go through that analysis. Then you go through an official public meeting or public hearing. Um, you have a series of those, and then you go through JCAR, the Joint Action Committee through the legislature, and you present your rule, and then it gets voted on. So it's a very lengthy process, but it's also a very involved process. We're proud to say in Ohio, we work very, very hard on the pad construction rule and emergency notification rule and others, make sure industry was at the table. Uh, notification rule that's gonna become effective on uh, December 8th. We had 21 months of meetings, <coughs> 21 months of meetings on our draft rule. Um, we had eight in-person meetings where we invited the affected parties to come in. We had many, many dozens of conference calls with the affected parties. We gave the industry 22 versions of that draft rule, which they commented on every one of them, and we incorporated many of those changes in. We went through the JCAR hearing a couple of weeks ago. So the effective date of that rule will be on December 8th. The process is very involved, and I think you have a better rule when you include parties that are affected by the rule, and also those that are interested in the outcome of the rule. Thanks, Frank. Finally, we're going to turn to the good Senator, Troy Balderson, uh, and here's your question today. In the eastern parts of Ohio, where Utica is being developed, there's been a meaningful shift over the past three presidential elections towards candidates supporting domestic oil and gas production. 
Uh, and in fact, if you looked at uh, Trump's victory in Ohio, uh, that part of the state uh, had a huge impact on his victory here. Can you describe how oil and gas development has impacted your constituents and accounted perhaps for this change in attitude and voting patterns? Thanks, Andy. Um, I got the best question. When I saw this coming out, I thought, oh my God, this is, this is phenomenal. Um, you, you know, during this last process uh, of the election, it was truly one of the most, how, how many of you in the room made it down to Eastern Ohio? Now I know I got two colleagues here from the Shaker Heights of Appalachia, Muskingum County, Mr. Sidwell and Mr. James. Jerry has switched on us, went to Washington County, but how many actually saw the Eastern part of Ohio in this last presidential election, other than Jimmy Stewart, as I see pop up too? Okay. It was the most exciting thing that's happened in that area since the oil and gas shale place showed up in 2010. Um, it was fun anywhere you walked in. Uh, I was in Belmont County more than once. Uh, there's a place there called Jane's, uh, right there in Morristown. Phenomenal place. Balderson, as soon as I come through the door, Balderson, you're still a Trump guy, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, and it wasn't just one or two people asked me that question. It was the whole room and the whole restaurant. So it was so much fun. Um, why are they excited? Because I'll use a couple examples. In 2009, Noble County had an unemployment rate of 20.9%. Listen to me, 20.9% unemployment in 2009. In 2015, 74 They want to work. They will work when you give them any indication that there will be jobs for them so they can put food on their table, support their families, engage their families, they will be there. And the constituents in this eastern part of Ohio always will be there. And they thrive on that. Um, you know, I, I know Senator Padgett has, has served in this same region that I have, and Sometimes I feel like, okay, here I am again, coming from the Appalachia region. I'm whining and crying a little bit. I'm sure Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati's tired to hear the same old story. But he, he, here's, a, here's a legislator's story that I got a guy from Cincinnati that was a legislator. And uh, he wants to go and see. He's anti-fracking and he's anti-this. And I, I said, come take a ride. T just, let's take a day and go for a ride. So we ended up down in all the good country of Belmont County and Noble and Monroe and seeing some of the, you know, Mr. Moore's projects that, that he had going on. But as we're driving through these state routes and these gravel one-lane roads uh, through, through, the, through these counties, he looks at me and he says, people really live in these houses out here? And I said, yeah, they do. And they love it out here. They love it. And, th and this is where they're from. This is where they're going to stay. They're not going anywhere. Where do they get water? How do they have internet? How do they have a, you know, electricity? they manage and they make it happen uh, and, and they thrive on that. So for Mr. Trump to come along, God bless him. He's got his work cut out for him because uh, the, those people down in that region are, are counting on him. And, and I think some of the most, uh, you know, things that he can do effectively and quickly for this industry and, and any other industry that's out there pertaining to natural resources is deal with the regulatory issues that we face. And th those are something that he can have a direct impact on quickly uh, to keep this industry going and, and to, to bring it back. Um, another number that I had in my head was um, in Guernsey County for um, a bed tax, okay? In 2009, uh, Guernsey County's lodging tax was $709,000. In 2014, it was $1.9 million. That's $1.2 million increase. You know what that community did with that money? Reinvested it. You can see it, okay? They're not blowing it. Local governments are all in. They're in. They want to support this industry. They want to be part of it. Um, yes, they get frustrated sometimes, but they want to be part of it. So um, the industry is letting them be part of it and going to the table. So uh, I'm very excited for what's going to happen and continue to happen in Eastern Ohio. Um, and if anybody wants to come down and, and do a little drive around, it is truly the most fun you can have uh, run around the district. It's, that, it's interesting, as you mentioned, the uh, increased interest. Uh, as we talk to people, it's amazing how the state's really two different 
factors. Uh, anywhere to the east of Columbus, they understand the impact here and how it's a game changer. And people to the west who do not have this development have a whole different approach and outlook <laughs> on the whole thing. So I was talking to Congressman Johnson yesterday, and, and Bill was, um, and I've, I've kind of been joking with him, but Bill, Bill Johnson won Monroe County. I, I, uh, rumor is that uh, Republicans has not won Monroe County uh, since the early 80s. Uh, Bill not only won Monroe County, he won by 30 points. Um, and, and, and Bill, as, as he ended up telling me also, was one of the third highest vote getters in the U.S. Congress delegation of the Republicans. So that's that switch. He represents 18 of those counties down through there. But to see them so motivated, um, one more story, my dad, so my dad had a massive stroke about four years ago now. So I'll, I'll put him in the vehicle and we were going to go down through Guernsey County and make our way down to Belmont County to, to look at some cattle. He wanted to see some cattle. And uh, you know, he just can't have a real hard, long conversation, but he, he'll pop up every once in a while. But he says, I won't say quote exactly, because he had a few cuss words in there, but he said, look at these Trump signs. I mean, thousands of Trump signs. And maybe on that, going through those three or four counties that we took to get down to Belmont County, we saw four Hillary. And, and he just, he couldn't believe that. He just had never seen anything like that. So it's fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now to show you that we're actually taking the questions, here I go. I'm gonna go into audience questions. Uh, and since they're almost exactly the same thing, I figure we better get this one asked. And it's always the elephant in the room, if you will. Uh, so the only one that doesn't get on, put on the spot for this one is Rick. Take a break for a second. And uh, uh, we're going to ask the question, uh, what do you think about increasing the severance tax on oil and gas in Ohio? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> Did you really start with that one? <laughs> There's two, there's two of them. <laughs> Sixty-seven percent of the questions so far received are that question, Mike. I'd like to hear your answer. <laughs> Mike's had the biggest rest period because he took the first oh, question. So we'll go goodness. to you first. Uh, is this being filmed? Yes. Um, so listen, we you know uh, this industry started uh, for the state of Ohio back in 2010, and you know, to be quite frank, uh, the severance tax um, that you, the severance tax structure you have currently is uh, a very low level of severance tax compared to other oil and gas producing states. Um, we were um, certainly working uh, with everyone in the state of Ohio hoping that we could find a, a common ground on um, severance tax, one thing that we were passionate about was returning as much money as possible that was, that was created through severance tax back to the local communities where we, where we operate. Um, so we did actually give written testimony on the original um, uh, House bill severance tax that was proposed a few years ago. Um, since then, there's been uh, initiatives back and forth and uh, generally, we've been involved in most of those. So I'm going to be vague here um, in answering this question, but because I, uh, I'm industry, um, and so certainly um, I want the tax to be friendly to my industry, but I think there's a compromise out there, and, and I hope that, uh, that we can find that right compromise between uh, what the state needs and, and what uh, continues to motivate industry. So. Um, I've, I've tried to stay out of um, um, anyone's opinions but my own uh, as it relates to severance tax. And so I've tried to be, have an independent voice. I've, I've talked to Governor Kasich personally on this uh, many times. I've worked with his staff. I've talked to Rick and, and Fred um, at ODNR. Um, and so um, I've, I've, I've have a lot of conversations with Troy and, and other folks in both the House and the Senate. So I'm, I'm willing to talk about it uh, and I'm willing to find a compromise and I'm, I'm sure at some point it's gonna be um, reintroduced and we're gonna be having some conversations. Um, at some point, you know, it probably will be changed, um, but I'm not gonna tell you what I think it should be. <laughs> Andy, maybe I could, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, Mike has, has uh, you know, answered that 
well, I, I think maybe just some of the other considerations. Capital has become very, very expensive over the last year and a half. And uh, as a good example, we, we have a master limited partnership. So, you know, we typically are funding all of our growth or most of our growth by going to the capital markets. We either borrow money or we're issuing incremental um, limited partner units, so incremental equity to fund our, our growth. And uh, you know, we, unlike some corporations, we distribute almost all of our free cash flow to our limited partners. And uh, so we do not have sort of excess or, or free cash flow that we're reinvesting in, in the business. So when capital got expensive, capital is also now very disciplined in terms of where it wants to be deployed. And it is going to go, if we have alternatives in terms of deploying our capital, we are going to go to the lowest cost or the highest return space. And I, I think it's, it's just worth remembering when people are going through this conversation. I understand the comment about compromise. Compromise is important. If you want Ohio to attract capital that's expensive, it has to be competitive or more competitive with its surrounding states. And that is the way you're going to continue to fuel the growth in this state. Yeah, and I might, I might add to that. That's a great comment. Um, you know, we were very close um, on severance tax a few years ago, I thought, um, from all sides. And then unfortunately, we had something happen uh, called a collapse in commodity prices which made it very, very difficult to bring that to a conclusion as, um, and then this kind of goes back to, to Don's point, uh, producers were uh, quite literally trying to stay alive. Um, and you did mm -hmm. see quite a few producers file bankruptcy through uh, the process of the last couple of years. Most of those are folks who had a lot of leverage, um, which is the, one of the reasons that we don't operate that way. Um, so. Um, it was really, last couple of years was a survival mode for our industry um, and probably to some extent to Don as well because um, uh, less drilling means, you know, less capital for projects that he needs to fund as well. And so kudos to the state of Ohio for recognizing that that was a difficult time to push through a severance tax initiative, but now that we are more constructive on well, and gas prices for uh, for 17 and beyond, I suspect that that discussion might get resurrected at some point. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, going back to my capital question or capital comment, you know, the capital for us in the two-year period since you know two years ago, it's probably three times as more as expensive to raise equity as it was two years ago for us. So, I mean, it's a meaningful difference, and it hasn't gone away, and and you know, it doesn't go away immediately. It, it you need to keep funding it and, and you know I don't think we can lose sight of the importance of, of people's cost of capital. Senator, you got anything you want to throw in there? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> notice that n n notice severance tax, um, it will come back up. I mean Mike's right. Um, and I'm sure it'll be in this next budget. Um, that'll be in, w in one of the proposals. Uh, again, we'll, we'll, let's go back down to the eastern part of Ohio and let's have that conversation mm -hmm. again and, and talk about the the region that um, a lot of us work in or serve, um, they're not acceptable to it. I mean, now they're, they're going down through another downturn right now. And um, it, it, it's something, and, and there were earmarks talked along the way, and, and, and Mike's right. I mean, he, you know, he provided a lot of insight um, on, on some things. I shouldn't say a lot of them, but. Um, and, and different ways to kind of time to look at that and, and getting back to the communities. But when I went back to the communities and said, you're earmarked for 23%, it, it, it's a, you know what, no. I mean, that's, that's not enough. And they, as I said earlier, let, let them do their thing down there. They, they, these local governments, these local communities are engaged the state of Ohio has dictated to them quite a bit. We've cut a lot of their funding. We're letting them manage more of their money. And they're doing a really good job with it. So um, I will vote no on severance tax in the next budget if the House doesn't yank it out. I think Governor Kasich said that uh, last month, uh, I got another bill that's going on out there called Senate Bill 320 with energy mandate stuff, but um, so he's on, he's not on my list, but I think he also said that he understands that, you know, he probably won't get it through the house either, but uh, I'm sure that conversation will come up. 
Very good, thank you. Um, Again, it's interesting, the audience wants to know a lot of what we thought you might want to know. So we've got a question and we're going to throw this out to the panel. And I might start with Rick just in case uh, he's got a little insight that he could share. Uh, this one says, I'm from Pittsburgh. We're going to forgive that part. <laughs> uh, and uh, the shell cracker plant over that way, what's the update on the Belmont cracker? So we did want to talk about crackers and uh, their likelihood and, and impact, and Rick, can you start off a discussion on that, maybe? Yeah. Um, conversations with PTT, a type consortium, um, continue. Uh, they are looking at potentially building a cracker in extreme uh, east central Ohio. Um, it would be a cracker, if it's built, that's very similar to the cracker that's proposed for the Pittsburgh area by Shell. The cost for that cracker would be similar. Um, the associated infrastructure would add quite a bit of uh, additional monies to that project. It would add a lot of jobs. One of the problems that might have to be overcome with either cracker is that of storage. Um, as ethane is piped to a cracker, uh, that $6 billion cracker is limited by the amount of ethane that it can receive and process. So if a pipeline goes down that can't deliver, then a, a very expensive cracker um, has limited ability to process. So stored ethane is a very important component of that. But uh, the, the talks do continue. They look promising. And uh, we're very hopeful. Anybody else want to chime in on crackers? Well, I just say, you know, we were an early committer to the Shell Cracker plant, and we are uh, scheduled to be an anchor tenant on that plant, and that, of course, was before the PTT project was announced. But, I, you know, I think I read something recently that said that um, the um, anticipation is that in 2017 there's going to be 21 percent more ethane demand because of um, I believe there are six cracker projects scheduled to be completed uh, during 2017. So all that's positive, but quite frankly, any local demand for any products is good. And Don touched on this. Um, you know, we're having to spend a lot of money uh, to pay for um, space on pipe to, to move our molecules mm -hmm. out of the basin uh, because of the distress pricing that we get in basin. So. Um, and I, I spoke with the Lieutenant Governor for about 30 minutes before uh, the panel and encouraged her to continue to focus on um, creating um, industrial demand, um, power plant demand, what, whatever it might be, whatever projects could um, encourage us as producers to be able to not have to continue to ship our molecules out of the basin and be able to sell it. Um, at a reasonable price in the state of Ohio. Where that's go where that site's going, I mean, there, again, I keep saying the same word, but the extreme Belmont County. <laughs> uh, you know, landowners are talking about it, people are talking about it. I'm going to incorporate a question into maybe a little bit broader question because one of the questions from the audience uh, has been, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, public sentiment that Lisa's expressed out there when you see protests over uh, <clears throat> different uh, portions of the industry and its growth uh, and pressure on regulators to, to do different things. Um, I think that might be part and parcel of asking a bigger question, and that is what's maybe the biggest short and long-term risks for the industry? And maybe how do you view literally this, this public push at some of the local levels and all to try and prohibit uh, the, the industry from moving forward? Is that really a big risk? Uh, is it just a pain in the neck? Uh, and you know, what, what are some of the more bigger challenges that need to be overcome? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll start or you can start. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, you know, so we, we generally have found the state of Ohio to be a, a friendly state. Um, there have been isolated pockets of, 
protest, and I don't know when you speak about short-term and long-term risk, I don't know if you're thinking about environmental risk, environmentalist uh, opposition risk, or the other, all the other risks that we face. But, um, I, you know, I would say we, we generally um, don't have a lot of opposition. Um, uh, this state, the ODNR has been very user-friendly, and I think they've done a tremendous job um, in adjusting the rules and regulations to account for this new industry that sprung up basically overnight. Um, you know, again, there are isolated pockets and areas of, of rural um, Appalachia um, <laughs> where you have some opposition. Usually it's one or two people. Um, and so it could be that because this is a newer industry for the state of Ohio, then let's say Marcellus, that those opposition groups aren't as mature as developed. And that's kind of bad news, possibly. But uh, I, I generally don't think that I see, I, I don't view Ohio as a state that I have a fundamental worry about um, uh, a risk to my industry from opposition. Now certainly we have to be good stewards of the environment, and so if our industry are good actors and we're doing things the way that, that Rick tells us we're supposed to do them, um, then I think that's going to quelch a, a lot of the opposition that you see if we're not um, polluting water sources, um, you know, if we're not, um, if we're constructing pads in the right way um, and if we're um, repairing the roads that we drive on, um, if, if we're good citizens in the way that we conduct our businesses, I, I just think we can, we can contain the amount of opposition to our industry. Now you're always going to have people who don't understand what fracking is and automatically assume that it's bad and most of the folks who are anti-frackers, you probably would ask them a question about what fracking is and they probably couldn't tell you what it is, quite frankly. Um, there's no, I've been in the industry 38 years. I will tell you, I have never seen one single incident of groundwater contamination from fracking or subsurface water contamination from fracking. So um, I, again, I think if we do things in the right way and we continue to work with ODNR to, to make sure that we're all following the rules, um, I think that goes a long way from mitigating uh, the risk of um, opposition. Uh, I think one last thing, and I'll stop talking. Um, I think the other thing that Ohio has done right is bring the entire um, oversight of the oil and gas industry to the state level, rather than letting um, some of the individual counties and, 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 and areas, local areas, have some of their own um, rulemaking um, ability as it relates to oil and gas. So I think that's helped Ohio avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen in, in perhaps some neighboring states. I represent part of Athens County. I say no more. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would agree with what Mike said about Ohio, but I guess I, my view is that just abiding by the rule of law or being a good actor, I do not think, um, I, I do not think protects us from a real risk of having the keep it in the ground folks um, make real progress and uh, you know uh, we as a as a company Marathon Petroleum as a company have historically you know we have done our thing we've allowed other exploration and production companies to do their thing or midstream companies to do their thing I think we are way too apologetic about our industry which is a fantastic industry I think we play defense all the time and never play offense I think we forget to support I, I think we forget to support folks who are having issues because if you get a precedent set in any state, I don't care which state it is or which uh, municipality, a bad precedent somewhere I think leaks into ultimately leaks into sort of where you think you're doing a good job. So we have become much more proactive in filing briefs in support of other industry players that are facing issues. We are trying to do a much better job of helping people understand the facts. Mike talked about fracking. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a common misunderstanding, of, not only about fracking, but about all the things that we do as, as, a, as an industry, in my, in my personal opinion. I mean, the Dakota Access Pipeline, not to get on a soapbox, but the Dakota Access Pipeline is a 
classic example. You see what you see about the protests, and I would, I would encourage you to, the, the judge early on issued that uh, sort of like a 50 page ruling around the, uh, you know, the or, original injunction. You should read that 50 page document. It's pretty easy reading, and it is amazing how much that company, you know, energy transfer played by the rules, did the things it thought it needed to do, reached out, had conversations with organizations like yours, Rick, and trying to get involved and, and have those dialogues and find themselves in a situation now which I think is really, uh, you know, less about facts than it is about, you know, less about facts than it is about, you know, p people's view around the energy sector. So, I guess, sorry about Rick. I wanted to add one comment on this. Laws can be a hindrance, short term or long term. They're necessary. Without laws, society falls apart. Um, but laws have to be well thought out, and they have to be based where appropriate on good science. You know, people say injection wells cause earthquakes. Sometimes they do. Um, people will argue they can cause groundwater contamination. They potentially can. Um, fracking. You, you hear that that might cause some of the same effects. But you can have a reaction and say, let's ban that, or you can ask the question, can common sense and good science regulate this properly? If it can, then you create a statute that allows the regulatory agency to use common sense and good science to properly regulate instead of banning. Uh, that's an important component of all of this. Rick, are we regulated up at this point? I mean. You mentioned there's a couple new rules coming uh, on uh, into effect here shortly, but do we have the right structure right now, or is there more that needs from a regulatory viewpoint? Are, are there more things that uh, the department's looking at building in? Um, the statutory structure, the laws, are largely where they need to be. There are a couple exceptions to that that we have to work on. Um, the rules, we are beginning to update those. We're going through the process where we work with the industry and, and interested parties. Uh, so for the next year or so, that's what we're going to be really focusing on. But the statutes, with just a couple of exceptions, are in pretty good order. Good. Uh, we're going to get we're getting close to time, but I wanted to hit one only because it's a little bit different vein, uh, and I think I know even who might have written this one. But boiling it down, it says. Is there outreach right now by the industry to universities and educational institutions to help with training for the workforce, uh, retraining, uh, further education for workforce, uh, those things that are kind of built into the needs of the industry? Is, is that being done uh, with some of the educational institutions? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I thought I saw Rhonda here. There she is in the back. Um, and and uh, I, I think this industry has been working very hard. Um, and it's something new for them to get inside of our educational uh, providers that we have. And the VOED programs that we have going on right now, uh, we have one in, in Buffalo and uh, with welding. Uh, there's a gentleman down in Washington County um, that has started his own uh, welding project. Uh, welding education program uh, and he brings these kids in that are, are sophomores and juniors and, and gets them down there uh, and educates them and lets them be high school students also at the same time and that's important and the other thing that he does is before you even start down there um, you sit down either grandma or grandpa who's ever your legal guardian with that student you sit down with him and you go over what your expectations are and what they want from you when you do it. So there's no misinterpretations of something that would happen and you can't show up or, or whatnot. But if you're gonna wrestle to high school, you wrestle. But you're gonna be down here too. Um, and, and I think for the industry to keep doing that because you know, it seems like we get trapped, we get caught in all this bureaucracy when we try to get you know, a high department of education uh, in, in, involved in it. It's up to the business owners. And, and, and in my past world of, of, of running a car dealership as, as far as a shop, I mean, I'm a mechanic by trade. Where's the first place I went to? I mean, my dad said, the one guy you want to hire is a farm kid. Because they know how to work on anything, and I can attest to that. Combines break down at midnight. 
and they were pieces of junk back in 1970. So they don't have all the GPSs, but you want to hire that kid, and you want to get that kid, young man, in there, young woman. There is a, the first female student is at the welding program this past year also. But you want to get these kids. These kids want to work. And we have this perception out there that kids don't want to work. They're lazy. They don't want to do anything. Yeah, there's a couple of them out there. But if you give them a nudge that says, look, we can do this for you. We can help you get down this path. Tell us where you want to go. Um, those kids are starving for it. They, they want it and they want to embrace it. Um, you take a, 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 a young man, a young woman into this welding program, you're going to work six, seven days a week. You're going to make $150,000 a year. I mean, how do you do? Mike, you got to... Well, I, I would, you know, I would say um, training is critical. We, you know, we've had, um, I've had many conversations. I know um, uh, our uh, guys have also had many conversations with university administrators, um, heads of the Votex about um, what we need to get trained workers um, in the state of Ohio. Um, you know, again, uh, as Troy mentioned, um, this, this is a, a rural area. These are new jobs. I, I was recently, um, about six weeks ago, we did some training in our office in St. Clairsville. Um, I was there, some of our guys were there. And I asked for a show of hands um, uh, related to years of experience in the industry. And of course, I was the old guy in the room. But uh, it was interesting how more hands went up the less number of years you were talking about. And by the time we got to, I think, the level of two years of experience or less, I would say, guys, what do you think? 50% of the guys in the room probably had their hands up. So that just tells you that this, this industry is still very new. We need trained workers from the state of Ohio. We need trained workers who live in the area where we're operating in these rural Appalachia area. So um, I actually think through our foundation, we have uh, funded some uh, grants of training programs um, through our educational pillar with FAO. Uh, and so we're encouraging uh, those programs to be developed. Great. Mike, I think we've, yes. we've run the time out. With Andy, you did a great here. job. Wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, just though in the spirit of the program, which was a look back at 2016 and a look forward to 2017, could each of you in less than 30 seconds, <laughs> less than 30, starting down with you working our way down, I just compared to 2016, how are you looking at 2017? 2016 was survival, 2017 is optimism. Andy, uh, Andy you I, too, from that's your a great line, I'll just say ditto. Uh, rig counts on an upward trend. We have an accurate rig count on our website. We post it every week. That's a good indicator of the direction everything's going. Senator? Don, ditto. Excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are very, uh, very much more optimistic about 17 versus uh, 16. We've already announced plans to ramp up um, twice the level of activity in 17. We had over 16. But after listening to Troy, I'm thinking about adding a couple more rigs. Add, add, add more <laughs> rigs. More, add more rigs. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, panel, uh, Andy, for leading us. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, every, the panel will be around for a few minutes if you want to come up and ask a few more questions. But thank you again for attending this forum.